if you're lucky enough to be a parent, you've held that baby in your arms and you look at them going, I don't care what your life is so long as you're happy. If that's all you wish for somebody that you care intensely about, then maybe you should also wish that for yourself. And the interesting thing is, as a leader, you are the one role modeling the behavior that everybody else should be doing. And so if you're turning up overwhelmed, if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not taking ownership in your own contentment, then that says to everybody else, that's how you thrive in this organization because you're the leader. So that's what I have to do. I have to be like that to succeed. And what will happen is you will either get a node of other people that do those behaviors or they leave. When was the last time you felt on top of your workload? Do you find yourself answering too busy every time someone asks you how you are? Do you ever wake up on the first day after a holiday with a feeling of dread in the pit of your stomach worrying about everything you've got to get done in the week ahead. If you're anything like me, the line between busy and overwhelm is very thin and it's very easy to tip into a rising feeling of panic and anxiety when I think about my to-do list. Recently, I've been thinking a lot about busyness and overwhelm and I'm convinced that a mindset shift is necessary. We're never going to be able to get everything on our to-do list done. But whilst we're working on that mindset shift, somehow we need to be able to deal with the enormous workload we have right now. So this week on You Are Not A Frog, on our first episode of the new season, Gary Halls, an organisational psychologist, joins me to discuss what to do when you get that familiar feeling of overwhelm. We talk about the toxic culture of busyness and Gary shares a couple of very simple exercises you can do when you don't know where to start to deal with this feeling of overwhelm. So listen to this episode to find out how to tell if you're overwhelmed and why acknowledging this is a very powerful first step. How to become optimistic, even if you can't see how anything will change. And a simple yet practical tool which will help you halve your to-do list. Welcome to You Are Not A Frog, the podcast for doctors and other busy professionals in high stress, high stakes jobs. I'm Dr. Rachel Morris, a former GP, now working as a coach, trainer and speaker. Like frogs in a pan of slowly boiling water, many of us don't notice how bad the stress and exhaustion have become until it's too late. But you are not a frog. Burning out or getting out are not your only options. In this podcast, I'll be talking to friends, colleagues and experts and inviting you to make a deliberate choice about how you will live and work so that you can beat stress and work happier. If, like me, you've really enjoyed some time off over the summer but are slightly dreading the onslaught of work and family-related tasks that seem to multiply at this time of the year, then help us at hand we've created a free toolkit to help you take stock of where you're at and then plan how you will start to deal with that really important stuff you need to do rather than burying your head in the sand and just firefighting the urgent stuff. So click on the link in the show notes to sign up for your free overwhelm busting toolkit. And now here's this week's episode. It's really wonderful to have with me today on the podcast, Gary Halls. Now, Gary is a corporate behavioral psychologist. She works with leaders in big business and she specializes in the future of leadership and really helps people enjoy their work again. Now, Gary, we met on a retreat, didn't we? We did. We treated ourselves to a retreat. It was interesting on that retreat. I just had a week where I'd had the kids off school and I was trying to work at the same time. So I must say when I got on that retreat, I felt really, really quite overwhelmed and really in need of a break. And it it would have been nice if it was like two weeks long. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's interesting how long it takes us to switch off to be ready to be in that moment, right? It's it, it always surprises me. Well, whatever you're doing, you have to decompress before you can really step into it. I guess one thing I noticed on that retreat was the level of overwhelm I was feeling at the time. And a lot of us there were talking about overwhelm. And overwhelm is what we want to talk about today. Because I work obviously in healthcare, you work in big business. And the things that you've been saying to me about people that you work with sound very, very familiar to be honest. Is it the case that people are overwhelmed at the moment, even outside of healthcare? Overwhelm leading to burnout, whether they are on those two, is very much 
happening at the moment. And I think it's partly because we're still learning about how to get the balance of this mix of working from home. I also don't think it's just a COVID thing. There was a large amount of overwhelm beforehand, but perhaps it's more obvious now. People are hopefully more talking about it a bit more. I'm driven by a, a, a real passion to help people enjoy work. Can you imagine in actually enjoying work? Imagine your work was fun. How do we access that? Yeah, it's interesting because I think at the moment, most of, got, most of us have got a very low bar for work. It's like, well, if I can just survive work, that'll be, that'll be fine. But I don't think that's fine at all. Not when we spend so much of our time at work. If it is just surviving, then what on earth are we doing with our lives? But we really are in that mindset at the moment, aren't we? Well, and the ironic thing is that there's a lot of evidence coming out, mainly from Harvard University, actually, in behavioral psychology, that if you're in an enjoyment state, if you're actually enjoying your work, if you're more in the flow, you make decisions quicker. Doctors diagnose better um, when you're in that state. So it's kind of counterproductive to just be in that miserable state. But it, it's deep rooted. I think we sort of expect work to be miserable and it doesn't have to be. Now, let's just get the elephant in the room out to start off with. Well, it's, it's an elephant in my, in my room because I always have this nagging voice at the back of my head saying it's self-indulgent. It's self-indulgent to want to enjoy your job. And it has actually been said to me by a member of my family whenever I bring this up. Oh, this is so self-indulgent. Why should you think that you should really enjoy your work when there's millions of people around the globe that are forced to work? with very low pay in dreadful conditions who don't have a choice. And what about 30, 40 years ago? No one expected to enjoy their job. It was just a daily grind, blah, blah, blah. This sort of very woke, I've got to enjoy my job type thing. It's, you know, it's completely self-indulgent and selfish. And what are you talking about? (laughs) What would you say to that little voice in my head? it's, It's not a little voice, is it? That's quite a big one. So a couple of things come to mind. One is If you're lucky enough to be a parent, you've held that baby in your arms and you look at them going, I don't care what your life is so long as you're happy. And then you decide to put them onto the treadmill of GCSEs, A-levels, university and career expectations. All you've wanted them to do when they were this beautiful, fragile thing, looking at those deep eyes at you is just to be happy. And I think we have to remember that, that that's all you, if that's all you wish for somebody that you care intensely about, then maybe you should also wish that for yourself. That's one side of it. The other thing is that the assumption that if you're in a low skill job, a low pay job, you must be unhappy is not my experience. And I've had the privilege of working in all kinds of different things, including I think we talked about it in the retreat. I worked at Sewage Works for quite a while after I was getting some money together to go traveling after university. And the experience I had there was that there were a, there was a huge camaraderie there. It's a it's a tough job, and no, and it's not. There's not a lot of pride in the work for a lot of people doing it, but they found enjoyment in it. And I think the assumption is that you know, oh, poor, poor them. And I think there's a there's an indulgence in that as well. I'm not pretending that work should all be fun and ha ha. And and by fun, I mean satisfaction and contentment, rather than it's all a big laugh and it's full of banter. Sometimes I get people go, oh, you can't be laughing all the time at work. And the Victorians have a lot to answer on this one. So the Victorians taught us that we should be like the machines. We have to, you know, we shouldn't be having fun. The word silliness became a, a dirty word pretty much. And and actually in playful ideas, that's when we go, actually, there must be a better way from, to do this. Once you get into playful language, you go, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be crazy if we did this rather than the way we just keep doing it? We just keep if what wouldn't it be crazy if we stopped banging ourselves over our head with a mallet and we actually stopped and looked at a different way of doing things? And that for me is part of that. It's an indulgence. I think it's an indulgence not to enjoy work. <laughs> Does that sound crazy? So if you're if you're miserable and not enjoying it, you're not making decisions as well as you could be. You're 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 being a martyr, and you're not necessarily doing a job to the best of your ability. To me, that's one of the things I said, we are, uh, let's do this podcast, but not focus on the big high convoluted ideas. Let's take a step back and go, yeah, yeah, that's all very well and good to go. Yeah, I've got to enjoy my work. But if you're feeling, if you're feeling a bit shit, if it's like, I'm so far away from that. What I'd like to talk about is how do you even start? Should we talk about Let's that? talk about that. So I think we just need to accept as a given that we, you are not a frog, think it's really important to enjoy your work. 
and to thrive, not just survive. Now, if anyone completely disagrees with that, then there's lots of, you know, high powered productivity podcasts. But actually, if you do look at the evidence, you're absolutely right. It is about happiness and meaning, which makes us actually productive and successful, not about noses to the grindstone. So let's talk about how you even start when you're overwhelmed. Now, when I've been talking to people in healthcare, people working on the front line, one of the main things they will say is is workload. For them, it's, it, it seems to be workload. I think there's a, a lot of stuff underlying that as well. I think there's a, an inability to set boundaries and say, no, we've done other podcasts about about that. What about in the businesses you work with? Is it mainly workload and demands that's causing the overwhelm? Or do you think there's other stuff as well? I've got a bit of a bugbear about work-life balance actually as well, because I think the assumption is that there's work and there's life and that you can compartmentalize the two. Overwhelm comes from all of that. You have to look at a holistic view of what else, what, what am I overwhelmed with? And workload is absolutely part of that. In the corporate world, there's a never ending demand for more meetings. And I think they should be called different things like meetings, doings, thinkings, creatings, because meetings are generally really badly organized. Nobody really knows what they're there for. So they invite everybody because they don't really know what they're trying to achieve. And everybody goes, well, I don't really know why I was there in the first place because somebody else could make the decision and they're not even here. So that that's part of what happens in the corporate world. The thing that I ask people to do is, first of all, acknowledge, I think I might be feeling a bit overwhelmed. So when I start talking to people, if I'm doing one-to-ones or if, we're, if I'm working with a leadership group, it's like, what's going on? It's like, well, things aren't ha- you know, we aren't making big decisions. We're not as productive as we'd like to be. The, all those sort of, to me, they're symptoms, lack of productivity, not making the right decisions, things take too long. We're not very good at being innovative. We're not very good at coming up with ideas. To me, they're symptoms of we're not really getting into the right zone here. We're not really enjoying what we're doing. It feels like hard work. So the first thing is what's on your plate? Have a dump of everything that you're doing. Now that, again, I'm going to, I want to take a step back from that. That sounds easy, but it's really not. So the step before that is to have that phrase of, I think I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed. I think I might be, I think I might be a bit overwhelmed. It is enough. And that's an acknowledgement to yourself. I think I've got a bit too much on. I'm not quite sure where to start. Sometimes you might find yourself doing something completely unrelated to work. And that's sorting out a cupboard that you know doesn't help anything apart from that cupboard sorted because it's controllable. And actually there are times and that's a good thing to do because it takes you away from it. But if that list of things that's sort of sloshing around your head is ever growing, then the cupboard doesn't make that go away. No. So part of the next thing to do is make it go yeah, away. So so if you notice yourself procrastinating and just doing stuff that actually doesn't matter, it may be sort of a diversion tactic. And I'm I'm interested, yes. Gary, when you said I think we were talking earlier, it's a little bit about like like addictions at the first hurdle is actually admitting it. Because you know, I have lost count of the people who when you say, How are you doing? How's work? Busy, busy. That the word is busy that everybody uses. I hate the word busy. I'm trying not to use it if I I never use it anymore because I think if you're feeling too busy, then basically you're you're not managing things well enough. Or there is a there is a problem. I think if we start to use the word overwhelmed and just admit it to yourself, the word overwhelmed, yeah, I, I think people worry about using that. They think that might be a value judgment on them, make them look bad. You're admitting something in the first place. So do you think there's quite a bit of power just in that, okay, I'm feeling that busyness which has just tipped into the overwhelmed that means that there is something that is not right but once you admit that there's something that's not right then that means that you then have a choice about whether to deal with it or not and that's where it starts to get a bit scary I don't know so let's let's put overwhelmed to one side from it let's talk about busy so it's used as a greeting quite often how you doing are you busy it's a way of sort of is there room for have a chat or are you busy interestingly in different cultures I think the Chinese greeting is have you eaten I know the Mexican shaman um, will say, have you, are you, how well are you sleeping? 
So it's quite interesting. There's different sort of ways. And are we busy is very much part of how are you busy. Oh, yeah, yeah, really busy. Well, how are you doing? I'm busy, yeah. busy. Are you productive? Are you a worthwhile should... human being? Yes. So let's unpack busy a bit. So I'm independent. I'm freelance. So because of that, there's a there's the opposite of that. If you're not busy enough, it's also very stressful if you haven't got enough work. So I will I will quite often in an email saying, I hope you're I hope you're busy enough. And if we could if overwhelm is too far from you, if you're saying I'm really a bit too busy, I'm too I'm I'm busy, busy, busy. If you start using those phrases and saying too busy, well, you know, oh, I'm a, a bit busy. In fact, if you do this now, if you grab a pencil, unless you're out and about, you have to imagine it. Do two circles, um, put a dot in the middle and do a little pie chart of each of them. On one of them, do how you would like your day to be and include nighttime as well. So imagine it's a 24 hour clock rather than a 12 hour clock. Chop up. When would you like to be going to bed? When would you like to be waking up? When would you like that to be a solid chunk of sleep? What would you like to be doing before work? How many hours would you like to be working? What would you like to be doing in between? Would you like to have a lunch break? Imagine. And do the other one with what's your reality. And by your reality, I mean, open up your calendar on your phone or on your computer. And what does it really look like? And be honest about your sleep as well. And if if you start to go, well, that's the only way I can survive, really. I'm actually working 26 hours a day and not really sleeping. Then that's also a moment to go. Okay. So acknowledging, you know, in recovery from addictions, there is a, a moment you have to say, I need to do something about this. And the next step of that is acknowledging that you can't do this on your own. You can't resolve it on your own. Can I just go back to this pie chart thing? So I've, I've literally just done that as you're speaking. And I think this is a really interesting mind shift because I know that doctors don't like saying overwhelmed because they think it might imply that they're weak or that there might be something wrong with them, that they're overwhelmed because they've got so much on. But actually, when you do that pie chart thing, you just look at it. It's not a value judgment on you on whether you can't cope or whether you're stressed or anything like that, you know. And I hate the word can't cope, by the way, because I think our physiological stress response is a normal, normal response. It's your body's early warning signs or, or warning signs, not early warning. It's just the warning sign. But when you look at that pie chart thing, yeah, you're going, OK, right. Well, there I, I am spending far too much of my day at work. I'm not sleeping enough. So that is a definition of probably overwhelmed with too much stuff to do. And it's not at all a value judgment on me, my ability to cope, my mental toughness, my resilience. It's just a statement of the fact of the stuff that's filling my day. So I think that is just a really, really helpful thing to do. Like depersonalize it, take it, take it away from any sort of value judgment on yourself. So thank you. I quite often find leaders will say, yeah, I'm awake between two and four in the morning because that's when I'll get up and do some work, right? So that's that's an acknowledgement. And say, okay, how do you feel about that? And I say, well, it's how I get stuff, it's how I get stuff done because it's the only time when there aren't meetings in my diary. And we talk about a bit further and is, is that sustainable and is that, is that okay? I mean, for some people, it might be, right? So I uh, don't make a judgment on that to a point, but you have to be, start to be honest with yourself. And that's when working with somebody else is quite important. And I'm not suggesting that necessarily has to be a well-being professional. It could be a colleague, a friend. Even before that, I'm going to suggest you do something else. So if you have done the pie chart or even if you imagine your day, or even if you're happy to say, you know what, I'm too busy. If you like, you know what, I think I'm a bit, I think I'm getting close to overwhelm or I'm over, feeling a bit overwhelmed really. If you need to tell somebody and you don't know who to tell, I think they should email you, Rachel. Do email us, email me at hello at you are not a frog. Obviously we won't be able to do much to help with your overwhelm, but just acknowledging it and saying it and documenting, that's quite powerful, isn't it? Writing stuff down. You said you can't help, but actually your assumption is that you're asking to help. Ah. What, this is the first step of you helping yeah. yourself. And if it's just a line or if it's three pages, all of that is absolutely fine because it's about acknowledging it. It's what you need to do. You need to get it out. I think I'm drinking too much. If that's if it was an, an alcohol addiction, 
and start saying, well, what am I consuming is a part is a part of it. And and if if you if you don't feel you can reach out, then reaching out to hello at you are not a frog yes. dot com. Reach out, just say, I am feeling overwhelmed and we will send you a Thrive Week planner to help you do almost exactly that, that, that you just right. said. So then yeah. do it, do it and do it, next, sorry, the- do it straight away because yeah, there's power then. And then you've gone from your pre-contemplation bit in the change cycle to actually thinking actually there is an issue and I do need to do something about it. So thank you. So the thing that we were talking about in the retreat was actually It was as much about meeting lots of wonderful people, but it was also about how do we talk about what we do. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is the number of people that leave their work because the bosses are useless. They'll say, oh, my boss is hopeless. In fact, it's one of the number one reasons that people leave their job in the corporate world is because you know, the leadership was, there was no progression planning. There was no structure. In other words, my boss was hopeless. And I talk about that saying, well, Judge your boss, judge your leaders, if you have one. I mean, if you're a leader of practice, then you, that's the first part. But judge the people that you perceive to be the cause of your, your your problems. And then I do turn it on people and I say, okay, so judge yourself. You know, if you did a thumbs up or thumbs down like the Romans did, where would you position yourself? Are you are you hopeless as a leader? And I invite people to consider what does that mean? And I've broken it down into four big things that are happening in behavioral psychology at the moment. So I play with the word hopeless and talk about hope. And the first thing you have to do is take responsibility for your own happiness, H for happiness of hope. So happiness, some people say, oh, you should have contentment. I like to stretch it. In fact, I would really love it. People find joy, right? That's not imaginable for many people that are first acknowledging I'm really struggling right now. Taking response of your own happiness. And you know, you know all the things that you should be doing. The things that look after your own happiness are often the things that go straight out the window when you start to get to that too busy place. The exercise, the eating well, the meeting up with friends, the downtime, the the the, the mind for reflection, the the spending time outdoors, all of those things are so easy. I'm guilty of it too. They're so easy to stop doing when just another meeting, just got to sort this, this app, this admin, need to do the car insurance, whatever that I'm probably triggering loads of people going, oh God, God, I've got all of that stuff, right? But that's the first part of being better, a better leader. And when I'm talking about better leader, I'm not just talking about the people that report to you, but being a better leader for yourself. That is so important because particularly in healthcare, the people who I think at the moment are most overwhelmed are the leaders. So you've got incredibly overwhelmed leaders leading quite overwhelmed teams. And the problem is you then get that role modeling of this is how it should be. I'm so busy that if you lot aren't as busy as me, what are you doing? And then the leader has no empathy because when you are overwhelmed yourself, someone coming to you telling you that they're overwhelmed, your immediate, immediate reaction is, well, well look at what I'm doing. Why can't, why can't you do that? So it's incredibly difficult to be compassionate to your teams if, if you're feeling that, like that yourself, right? And the interesting thing is, as a leader, you are the one role modeling the behavior that you that everybody else should be doing. And and so if you're turning up disheveled, not sleeping, not coping with the, you know, with all the stuff that's going on, if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not taking ownership of your own happiness and your own contentment, then that says to everybody else, that's how you thrive in this organization, because you're the you're the leader. So that's what I have to do. I have to be like that to succeed. And what will happen is you will either get a load of other people that do those behaviors or they leave. So that the next part of hope is optimism, which again is incredibly hard to do. And so you have to first of all take some, start taking responsibility for your happiness. But optimism, optimism is not blind optimism. I'm talking about having a vision of how you want it to be. And so that's for yourself. How do you, that, that pie chart thing we just did is part of that, right? So let's acknowledge how you'd like your day to be on average. And then let's acknowledge the difference on that. So a vision of actually, I would like to be able to have some downtime or catch up with friends or, and as well as have 
eight, seven, eight hours solid sleep. How amazing would that be? So the, all of those things, acknowledging those differences and sharing that with the team of this is, let's talk about how, as an optimistic point of view, how would we like to be working together? What would we work like work to, what would we like our work experience to be? And what I get people to do is think about what you, what you would like to be feeling. What would you like to be saying? What would you like to overhear other people saying? And also what would other people notice? So if people coming into, coming across your team or coming into your practice or, or however you're working and say, I love going there or what's really, in, I, I, what, what, what little thought bubbles, draw, draw on post-its, little thought bubbles. This is what they're thinking or what they're saying when they're arriving or leaving. Oh, this must be a great place to work. Again, might be hard to imagine if you're feeling that, oh my God, so much to do. But a vision of what you want to do in an optimistic, not don't go wild like this is impossible. Make it, make it achievably optimistic. And you can do that yourself but also start to do it with the team. And I, I love that optimism because the minute you start saying optimism, my brain automatically goes to, well, there's not a lot to look forward to, you know, particularly in healthcare at the moment. We're in this vicious cycle where people are leaving, leaving more work for everyone else. So it's only going to get worse before it gets better. But actually, that's not what you're saying. You're talking about personal optimism. And you can do that because even if you look at a system that doesn't seem to be going anywhere good. I mean, I'm, I am hopeful that it, it will change and there are people working very hard on change as we speak. But actually, if it's personal optimism, right at the level of, actually, I'm optimistic that I can get my day looking more like my I, ideal day. And you can do that because you can control yourself, right? And I love that idea of actually, let's bring it down to what do you want people to be thinking when they come to visit you at work? Oh, and I was thinking, oh, well, oh, it, it's good fun here. Oh, the team get on really well. They're really supportive of each other. Well, if that's what you want people to be thinking, a small change you can make is literally go and have a coffee break together. Five minutes in a day. That is achievable. No matter how busy you think you are. I mean, sort of side note, I used to do a lot of leadership teaching. If I remember being on a course once and teaching about the importance of connection in a team and building trust and everything and just saying that I think the, the one thing, the one criteria I used to choose my surgery where I worked was, do they have a lunch break or do they have a, a coffee break together once a day to the team meet? Anyway, there was a, a table of practice managers who got incredibly upset and really angry about this, the thought that that we would suggest a 10 minute coffee break in a day where people could talk to each other. and. And they were, they were obviously overwhelmed. They, they couldn't get enough appointments. I could completely see where they were coming from. But to me, that is such a quick win that you can have yourself. Well, you've got to go to the loo. You've got to have a drink. You've got to take a break because we know you'll be more productive. Why not do it together where you can connect? And the problem in today's sort of virtual hybrid world where even people on the front line are, are in front of screens much, much more because they're doing telephone consultations, et cetera, et cetera. That hasn't been built into the day. So I think that is one really quick win that actually you are in charge of. And it could actually just change things a huge amount just in that very small space of time. So sorry, I've gone on a bit of a rant there, but I think it's so important and it's such a little thing that you could do. And if you start to do the optimistic how would we like it to be and then score it out of 10 you know coaching people do this quite a lot let's score it out of 10 of how are we doing now compared to what we would like so it might be I'll give it a three if we're lucky and the next question is because so many people in healthcare are high achievers you, you want to go from three to ten probably three to 12, you possibly could, even though it's out of 10. The, the next question is, how do you go to four? And four might be, let's have a coffee break once a week, right? Together. Let's not try and overdo it, overpromise it. Let's have a coffee break for, try, again, try not to overpromise. 10 minutes together, we down tools, we have a coffee break, or we have a something beginning of the day or end of day, just a small thing once a week. And then you review you know, do that for a couple of weeks. Are we getting closer to three and a half? 
And if you can get to three and a half, you might be able to get to four. And so you check in. And that coffee break conversation could be about how are we doing on what we hoped we'd try and achieve? And any other, has anybody got any other ideas that might give us another half increment towards it? Which leads me to the next part. Once you've got an idea of you're looking after your, your, yourself and you're role modeling that you are taking some self-care, you're more than self-care, you're maybe even starting to find some contentment if, and maybe beyond that, starting to find some happiness in your in your day and your week is to use that optimistic vision and let's get a bit playful. So what would be, you know, what would be a silly way? By being playful, you move from let's breed better horses and design better carts to wouldn't it be hilarious if you put an engine in a box and even imagine that there weren't any drivers? And that's where playfulness comes in. It will feel a stretch if you can't just leap to playful, right? So it's a stretch if you're not looking after yourself, if you haven't got an idea of what we're trying to aim towards. It's just, that's when it becomes unnecessary silliness. Oh, let's let's have an innovation brainstorming thing. You'll just come up with loads of ideas with no direction. And then the other, you already touched on the last bit of when I talk about what is a hope leader is empathy and connection so all of those things have been moving from self to talking about what how you'd like it to be maybe as the team how we'd like it to be and then also into how do we create together and be playful with what's possible how can we do this so differently that we revolutionize how we work together and that's that's part of play that's maybe again too much of a stretch how do we just increase those increments a little bit in a playful way is the final bit is empathy and really seeing what's going on with the people and knowing that some people are just working for money and that's fine. They don't they don't want to get involved in the process and the structure and the thinking. And other people, this is this is what they love. This is they what what do they love getting into the detail? Do they love thinking about the picture ideas? What else is going on in their lives? And it's very hard to connect with empathy. I know it's a big part of healthcare professionals' life to understand what's going on in people's lives, but really to understand what's going on with your colleagues and your team until you've started to acknowledge what's going on with yourself. Now, I, these are all big picture things. I would love if we could to spend a little bit of time just to go, that's all very well and good, but how do I start? So the first thing we talked about was acknowledge I'm more than busy enough. This is not just a one-off. This is a trend. If I drew the circles of what I want and what I want to be, there's a big difference. That's your first thing, acknowledge it yourself. The second is acknowledge it with somebody else. That might be with you, Rachel, or it might be with somebody that's a trusted other. So a partner or a friend, acknowledge, you know, I think I've got too busy. And then the next thing I do with people is to get them to write down everything that they know that they're supposed to be doing. And I use supposed to be as broadly as that. So that might be all of the work stuff. It might be all of the admin but also throw in, I need to think about a child's birth, my daughter's birthday. I need to think about the car insurance. I need to acknowledge that the kitchen needs redecorating. All Put them all on either a piece of paper, even better if you put it into a spreadsheet. So Excel or Google Sheets and write the list. And when you think you've done enough, you've got everything, open up your calendar, think harder, sit with it more and keep piling it in because oh yeah actually I've forgotten that I've also got to do that and I've also got to do this as well and make that list as honest as you can and doing that on your own is really difficult doing it with your trusted other somebody else or some a colleague that's also going I want to do this thing on this podcast listen to this podcast if if that if that floats your boat let's do this together so you hold each other to account what about this what about that study that you need to what about that paper you need to read what about that report or presentation you've got to do, throw or so that you help each other to make that list as hellish as you can, but as honest as you can. And then the next part of that is to score out of 20 everything on that list. So that's why I suggest we do it in an Excel sheet because it's easier to do. Out of 20, how would you prioritize this? How important is it? How, how would you prioritize it? Just give it a score out of 20. And the reason it's not out of 10 is because everything's at 10 out of 10 when you're in busy overwhelm mode. So I'm get, calling it 20 because you might go, that's 19, that's 14. Then with the other person, you again, you might sort it. If the other person doesn't know how to do, do sort in Excel or, or uh, sheets, then the other person will hopefully. So you get a list in the order of your scores. 
And then I invite you to find a line to halve that list. So pour, use Excel to draw a line or a sheet to, to draw a line across there, the half point, halfway point. And everything beneath that line, you'll work together with somebody else to work out what can you stop doing? What can you delay doing? What do you need to do to be able to delay it? You need to let somebody know that I'm not going to do this. I'm going to say no. Or it's actually, although it's there annoying me, it's not that important. Delay it. So yes, the kitchen does need decorating, but I'm going to plan to do that in three months time rather than try and feel that it's got to be done now. And then the third thing is delegate. Who could you delegate it to? And it does surprise me. A friend of mine works in creativity and productivity for artists and said that a lot of people don't realize that delegation is an opportunity for other people. So you feel there's something you've got to do. But actually, if you said, look, I'd like to hand this over to you, I'll support you. So that is a little bit of extra work in the meantime. I acknowledge that. But I would like to delegate it to you and give you an opportunity to stretch. We can have some supervision on it. We can enable you to do it. But you can start moving those things away. And then you're, you've got a list above a line. Now, if that list is manageable, then use your calendar to start planning. Be honest about how long it will take you to do each thing. That will take me two hours. That might take me three days. So maybe 18 hours or whatever. So be honest and then start planning in your calendar where that goes. So that means everything below the line you need to start getting rid of because you won't have space in your diary to do it. So you need to start getting rid of stuff. So there is often a little bit, first of all, it's like, okay, I've got more meetings to get rid of stuff. I need a two hour meeting or a 15 minute catch up with somebody to say, I'm going to do it. This is when I'm planning to do it. Any other thoughts? So you can manage it that way. The other thing that I want you to look at is if that list above that line is still enormous, having already done the delay, stop, delay, delegate. If that list is still enormous, then cut it in half again. And that is brutal. So then beneath that line again, you're looking at what can you actually honestly stop doing? Because there's some stuff above that line that you've all recognized is much higher priority. What can you delay doing and who can you delegate it to? I love that, Gary. It's, yeah, that's quite a simple technique, really. I mean, it's, it's simple, but it's really difficult, I can imagine, to actually draw that line. But we have to face reality that we can't do everything on that list. And that scoring out of 20, yeah, that really helps you say, what is the really, really important stuff here? And I guess in healthcare, we all do struggle to delegate. I think people say, oh, there isn't anybody to delegate to. I think that's sometimes the case. More often than not, it's because just the thought of delegating it and doing the process is just too much effort and it's going to take too much time to think about and sort out. And then you've got the loss of control and everything like that. But I think learning to delegate is is such an important skill and you also touched on the fact people think oh it's selfish it's dumping work on other people actually no it's not it's it's actually helping that person develop their own skills so really important and I think I love the stop delay delegate there's a free to focus sort of productivity thing which is eliminate automate and delegate I think automating a lot of the time delegating can be automating there's so many things and systems but I like the delay as well I think Sometimes it's just easier to think, well, I'll delay that than it is to eliminate. It, it, it's less psychologically tricky. So I've got this list of things I might, I might just delay. Then often you never get around to it anyway, but it's, I think, easier to delay. But it's a conscious delay. Mm. It's a conscious delay. So when we've got so much to do on our to-do list, those things are being neglected, but not necessarily consciously. So they, what they're doing is continually tapping you on the shoulder saying, you know what, this is supposed to be done, this is supposed to be done, this is supposed to be done. Really difficult to concentrate and enjoy doing anything else. If you've got all of these things like in your backpack of stuff that I know I'll never get round to, but it's got to be done, then if you're consciously stopping delegating or delaying. So your delay might be, I know I need to do this, but in reality, I need to do it. I, 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 it's not urgent. So I'm going to do it. And you put it in your calendar you plot it in your calendar for three months time. I mean, a year's time, if you need to, this is when I'm going to do that. It just, it means that you're consciously taking control rather than all the stuff feeling like it's controlling you. And I think this is where your, your playful stuff comes in as well, because our natural left brain thinking, particularly, you know, as, as 
professionals, maybe work in healthcare or law or accountancy or teaching, a lot of left brain thinking. We've got to think our way out of this. But if you can access that playful creativity bit of your brain, you're automatically going over to the right hand side of your brain and thinking, yeah, how can this get done in, an, in another way? One of the coaching questions I like to use, which can sometimes un- unlock this for people is, you know, if you had a magic wand, if you could wave a magic wand and anything could happen, what would you do? Oh yeah. Okay. I would, I would get three more wives and have them at home, or I would employ a unicorn to do, to take me to there. So I didn't have to take my car, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Is there another way to do that? Oh, well, I could just get an Uber <laughs> or I could just, yeah. one of my things is I would love someone else to plan and cook all my meals for me because I would like to be healthily, but I never seem to have time to plan it or cook it. If I had all the money in the world, what would I do? I would employ that amazing vegan chef that we had on our retreat. Oh my goodness. Imagine someone like her living in your house and just cooking all that food. Okay. I can't do that. But you know what? There are some really good meal box subscriptions that I could just do. And yeah, they're quite pricey, but actually most of us, and I think a lot of people listening to this podcast are probably time poor and more cash rich, I guess, although in today's, you know, difficult times that that's getting less, but most of us can probably afford the mailbox subscription, even a couple of times a week. So I've just, I've just done that again. I'm thinking, right, I want to eat nicely. I actually quite enjoy cooking to switch my brain off, but it's the planning and getting the ingredients and all that sort of stuff. So actually I've used that magic wand thing. You know, I would, I would hire my own chef to actually know there is something I could do that's that's almost as good that actually could help the kids to cook as well. Yeah. And then it actually brings you back to some reality and some stuff that you actually could do that doesn't cost a lot of time, that doesn't cost a lot of money, but you hadn't really thought of it before. We're educated to supposedly be good at everything. We have to be good at all things. And one of the things that I do when I'm working with teens is acknowledging that some people are really good at seeing the wood for the trees they can see the objectives they can see what's got to be done they can cut through the cut through all of the details and go right this has got to be done other people are really good at looking at the detail and going have we considered and have we thought about and give them give them a detail a detailed task and they're happy other people are really great okay we need to think about where we're going and we need to think about how we're going to celebrate the successes and other people like we need to listen to people we need to bring people along with us. Now we're all a bit of a mix of those, but it's really useful for all of us to recognize if I really hate doing something like a detailed task, there is probably somebody else in your team who that's their happy place. That's give me the opportunity to go through all of your procurement and work out where the best options are and and what we're, you know, drill down on the detail. If that's not your happy place, they're either will be somebody in your team that goes, oh my God, that, that'd be great. I'd love to do that. And if there isn't, that's probably one of the reasons that your team is struggling because there's nobody taking that as a na- then one of their natural strengths. Somebody's having to play out of one of their natural strengths and do all the detail and they feel overwhelmed by it because it's not a natural, happy place for them. I totally agree. And I think the trap we fall into is just because we don't like doing it, we think someone else won't like it and we feel that we're dumping the work on them so I've just got this wonderful team now and we're like okay we really need to document all our workflows and processes and for me I'm like oh do you do, do you oh. mind doing that and my team are like I love it this is what I absolutely love I'm gonna do it and they've done it absolutely brilliantly for me that felt like I was dumping my responsibility but for them it was like that's what they 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 really love and I guess it's like that for audit projects or quality assurance or even governance or Prescribe, you know, there, there's always somebody that actually really loves getting into that. You feel you're dumping, but you're not. Recently, I was listening to another podcast and it was two very successful entrepreneurs. They were both men with wives at home doing everything for them in the background. <laughs> so thinking, hmm. but one of the things they were saying is one of their mantras is it's not how can I get this done? Is that is who can get this done? As in, if I, yeah. if I if I want to do something, actually, who can do that? And I think when it comes to getting help, and particularly with stuff like this, it's who can help me? Let's not try and figure this all out on my own. Yeah, who can I sit down and do this spreadsheet with? Who can I get 
in my life that will be able to help me out with some of this stuff that I'm not so good at, be it a therapist, just be it a good friend, be it a personal trainer, right? <laughs> be it a dietitian if you need to get yourself sorted. Talk to someone who's done it before. They, and also, it doesn't have to be someone necessarily in person. It can be all these courses online. You know, if you want to learn how to do something, there will be something out there probably for free, actually. And then you can buy all sorts of stuff out there. So there is so much help out out there. I think particularly in general practice, because we are so used to having to do everything ourselves and the buck stops with us, we do just take on too much of this stuff ourselves, whether it is personal development or whether it is within our work. But just asking who, not how, sometimes can be really helpful. So I'd like to draw together all the things you're talking about. And I also want to check in with you, Rachel. So we talked about the first step, if you like, is acknowledging I'm not just busy. I'm, I'm a bit too busy. And the next step is to go, well, how would I like it to be? How would I like it to be? Rather than how should it be? But how would I like it to be? And how is it? So get it down on paper, draw little, draw those little pie charts. I, the next thing is to have a conversation with somebody else. And that is as much about you getting it out as it is somebody else hearing. Then there are things that you can do. If you're, if you're the simple thing that is sound simple, but is hard to do. And that's why I say you, it's make, works much better if you pair up with somebody and say, what I want you to do is I want an hour online. It works very well online. Get down all of the things that you do and start to look at where those are. Now, the other part is it's about taking responsibility for yourself. If you're thinking, oh, God, I'm feeling I'm being a bit hopeless at the moment, or I look at the team, they, we're just going through the motions, or my boss is hopeless, then the only person that you can influence is yourself. So you know all those things that you're supposed to be doing to look after your well-being, contentment and happiness. Add, the, in, add that into your to-do list and decide where you're going to prioritise it. Start blocking it in the diary. Start that thinking of how you want it to be and share it with the people you work with. Start to be playful with how we might make this better. How you go from three out of ten to three and a half out of ten. And then start listening to other people about what they want and what's working for them. And that's where delegation can also feel much more empowering rather than that you're giving people your dirty laundry. Somebody else might like to wash your dirty laundry. I just like to throw that in. I love that. Give your dirty laundry to someone else so they can wash it. Love it. Delegate. <laughs> Sometimes when I've been busy, I've wanted that. <laughs> right. You could also do that. There are ironing services. There are laundry services. There, you know, there's pretty much everything yeah. these days, which is marvellous. So, Gary, that was an absolutely fantastic summary. I, ne I normally finish by asking people for three tips, top tips, but actually you've just summarised that really, really well. And for me, this is so consistent with the message of this podcast about the little things you can do to make a difference. So don't try going from three to 10, go from three to three and a half. And if you're going from three to three and a half in lots of different areas, then suddenly you realize actually things are, things are a lot better. And it's these little small changes that we've made. And often it is just those small tweaks that we make to our day, like making sure we put that 10 minute walk at lunchtime or fitting in that 25 minute run. And we do have the time for those things. We do when we think about how much time we spend scrolling on Facebook or watching rubbish on the telly. There <laughs> is that time in the day, but it's actually, it's being intentional about it, isn't it? And so I just like to offer to listeners, firstly, if you need to just say to somebody, I am feeling overwhelmed and you don't know who else to say it to, just email us and say it to us and we will hear you. Secondly, if you want to have a conversation with somebody else and, and pair up and do this thing about looking through your to-do list, then again, let us know. And if we have people, we'll just literally introduce you via email and you guys can go off and do it for yourself. I'm a big, big fan of thinking partnerships and people supporting each other. Yeah, we can We can all do this for each other. And then thirdly, just think about yeah, sharing this with your teams. How can you do this where you work? Because if enough of you are thinking about doing this, then you will be able to change the system. The system 
will shift. And that is acknowledging that there are things we can't do anything about, like the patient demand, the workload at the moment. And and those are really, really big things. I do want to acknowledge that again, another elephant in the room. And people are feeling very anxious and worried about that. But let's start by focusing on yourself and what you can change. And then seeing how that will then actually extrapolate and affect the system. So Gary, is there any last messages you'd like to say? And by the way, I'm going to get you back on the podcast. Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, if it works for people, let, let if people let oh, you know. Oh, they leave us a review, let us know. Oh, and the other thing is that we will also put the Thrive Week Planner tool in the show notes. It's a way of doing those pie charts essentially and, and work out what your ideal week is, what your current week is and what the difference between the two is so people can sign up for that. And if people want to find out more about you and your work, then how can they find you? LinkedIn's probably the easiest. So you can put a link with the podcast and people can connect with me. I I enjoy hearing what's going on with people and I share various things about that, including taking breaks. Time off is time on is one of the things that I'm very keen on. Give your brain a chance to make the connections rather than to keep forcing it. If I, if I can, at the end of this, I am a bit of a hippie and I would like to invite you, if you're still here and you're still listening, is to take three deep breaths and just give yourself a moment. No, you're not alone. Gary, thank you. And we'll see you again soon. Take care. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening. Don't forget... We provide a self-coaching CPD workbook for every episode. You can sign up for it via the link in the show notes. And if this episode was helpful, then please share it with a friend. Get in touch with any comments or suggestions at hello at youarenotafrog.com. I love to hear from you. And finally, if you're enjoying the podcast, please rate it and leave a review wherever you're listening. It really helps. Bye for now.